Hello, I'm Nette Young and welcome to The 51%, a show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, the woman leading France's far right is now giving the country's mainstream political parties a run for their money. Also, as Europe prepares to mark the 70th anniversary of D-Day, we talk to a historian who's offering a darker take on the liberation of France. And we meet the woman who worked for Winston Churchill's School for Spies. But first, and she's rocked the French political elite to its very core. Marine Le Pen, the head of the far-right National Front, is dominating the country's political landscape after last week's European elections. Her party, founded by her father Jean-Marie Le Pen, clinched 25% of the vote, trouncing Francois Hollande's ruling Socialist Party. And as Katavan Gordistani reports, she has now well and truly stepped out of her father's shadow. From front pages to TV headlines, Marine Le Pen was the most talked about woman following her strong showing in the European elections. Three years after taking over from her father Jean-Marie, Marine Le Pen has made the national front a French political force to be reckoned with. Born in 1968, the youngest daughter of the party founder quickly followed in her father's footsteps. At 18, she joined the National Front and ran for office at 25. But Marine Le Pen first chose law as her profession before giving in to the family trade. I tried to escape politics by becoming a lawyer. I practiced for six years, but in time I realized that I was more and more into politics and less and less into law. In 1998, at the age of 30, she took over the National Front's legal department and gradually made her way to the top of the party, always sitting by her father. People say she's Jean-Marie's clone, she's the son he never had. She became vice president in 2003 before winning the leadership of the party in 2011. But the twice-divorced mother of three wanted to distance herself from her father's negative image and rebrand the National Front into a more acceptable party. Whether you're a man or a woman, Christian, Jewish or Muslim, heterosexual or homosexual, you're first and foremost French. She banned skinheads from her rallies and expelled members caught being openly racist, moves that did not always sit well with the party's more traditional wing, nor with her father. Do you follow his advice? Sometimes, but not always. What type of advice? That's private. When I don't agree, I don't follow his advice. Though she has succeeded in bringing her party closer to the mainstream, many still see Marine as just a sugar-coated version of Jean-Marie, standing for the same things, anti-immigration, anti-EU and anti-globalization. A couple of years ago, Marine Le Pen compared Muslims praying in the streets to the Nazi occupation of France, proof to her opponents that she truly is her father's daughter. As Europe prepares to mark the 70th anniversary of D-Day, one American historian is offering a darker view of the liberation of France. Mary Louise Roberts has drawn on a variety of sources, including French archives and American military records, in providing an alternative narrative. She says the liberation was sold to soldiers, not just as a battle for freedom, but as an erotic adventure among oversex French women. As a result, the French population came to view some of the soldiers not just as liberators, but also as men not to be trusted. And she's written a book entitled What Soldiers Do, Sex and the American GI in World War II in France, and joins me now from Madison in Wisconsin. Mary Louise Roberts, thanks for being with us. Now, we tend to view American soldiers as heroes, but your research found that that was not always the case. In fact, sometimes far from the truth. Well, I do think Americans were heroes. Uh, certainly they made enormous sacrifices in France, uh, but, but the GIs were also human beings. Uh, and so what I discovered was that when they arrived in France, um, they um, behaved as humans do, uh, in, in particular in terms of sexual relations. Um, I found, uh, for example, there was an enormous amount of prostitution uh, in France during the summer uh, of, of 1944 and onward. Uh, I also found a rape wave 
uh, in the summer of 1944 in Normandy. And in particular, things really soured between the Americans and the French during the summer of 1945 as the GIs made their way back to the United States. So, so what were the American soldiers being told about the French population before they landed on shore? The United States military had a problem motivating the troops, and by now, in 1944, uh, the troops had been fighting several years in the European theater, theater and, and many of them were exhausted. So the solution that the United States Army came up with, and I don't think this was strategic, um, but if you look at uh, the trench journal Stars and Stripes, which is uh, the, the propaganda um, uh, instrument of the United States Army, you see them portraying France as, um, as, a, as a country of women, as a country of beautiful women, uh, and women who are uh, in need of rescue, damsels in distress. Uh, and the idea was that all the American GIs had to do was get on those beaches and liberate France, and the French women would be there to greet them, uh, opening their arms to them, and, uh, and promising them sexual favors. And that certainly wasn't the case, was it, Mary Louise? Uh, no. <laughs> it was an accident of history that uh, the United States Army landed in Normandy, which was a peasant community, uh, and also um, a culture known for its stolidity and froideur. Uh, so uh, many GIs were surprised uh, by the reception they received um, from France, which was at that time a largely a country of women and older men. Um, so how has your book been received uh, in the States? Uh, the book has been really well received critically. I received um, a prize uh, from the French Historical Studies, which was a joint prize, a French-American prize, uh, and it's been really well reviewed. However, some of the popular response uh, has been negative. Um, uh, I've received great, a great deal of hate mail, um, particularly from um, you know, the crazy right-wing type of people this country seems to spawn, uh, and also from veteran groups who find uh, my portrayal of the GIs uh, offensive. Now, given that 70 years have passed since the end of the war, and of course attitudes have changed so much these days, particularly in the West, in the way that we view women and sexual violence, I mean, it would have been certainly impossible after the war to offer a more realistic view of what actually happened. Yes, I think that um, the reason the story has not come out is partially because the documents have been closed to the public, but also uh, partially because I think the French did not uh, want to appear ungrateful for their liberation because they were extraordinarily grateful for their liberation. Um, when I was in St. Lo, I had an archivist say to me, an American can tell this story, but not a French person. And that was in 2005. So. Um, so there's many reasons why this story has not come out yet. Mary Louise Roberts, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And 70 years on, there are still many tales to be told about life during World War II. One such book that's soon to be published in French is the story of British Prime Minister Winston Churchill's School for Spies. It's called The Secret Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries and is written by one of the last surviving members of the unit. Recently, I went to meet the author who now lives here in France. In this small cottage in a village on the outskirts of Paris lives an English woman with a remarkable story. Noreen Rioles was a member of British Prime Minister Winston Churchill's School for Spies during the Second World War. The then 18-year-old had caught the eye of her superiors thanks to her fluent French. She was sworn to complete secrecy. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. It it was only, I suppose, at that point when I was told uh, somebody else turned around and said, um, don't talk outside to anyone about what happens here and don't ask questions. The less you know, the less you can reveal if the worst happens. Her job was to help train new agents in the difficult art of espionage, dispatching them on missions while debriefing them on their return. The unit was known as the Special Operations Executive, or SOE, which supported the French resistance. I remember once Henri Diacono, who was a, a very young um, radio operator, he parachuted in at 20. And I remember he said to me, um, um, well, if you had your time over again, would you do it? And I said, would you? 
He said, I don't think so. He said, you know, we were so young, weren't we? We did not realise the danger. And when you're young, it's, uh, you're immortal. When the war ended, it would not be for another 60 years before she was allowed to reveal what she really did during that time. Her mother died, still believing her daughter had worked for the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries. Noreen went on to marry a Frenchman and raised a family here in Paris, remaining silent for decades about her war work. I cut myself off completely. I didn't, I didn't want to have anything to do with any of it. I wanted to turn the page and, and try and remake my life, but it's not very easy. Um, six years of war just doesn't go away from you like that. She's now written a riveting account of her stint in the SOE that's made it to the London Times bestseller list. It's also soon to be published in French. The book outlines in detail the critical role of women in the unit. A young man wandering about with a case like that was very suspicious and risked being stopped and searched. And, but a woman, now that was different. There were plenty of women wandering around. Nobody bothered to search them or stop them. And so the women were sent in as couriers, which meant that they were really kind of messengers for the, um, for the organiser of the, of the circuit. So in her opinion, do women make better spies? I don't know. I can't answer that question. I think they were all equally brave. And that's it for now. If you'd like to comment on what you've just seen, please head to our Facebook page, France 24, full stop the 51% or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. And thanks for your feedback so far. And please keep those comments rolling in. Until our next program, bye for now.